Joining us now to analyze today's headlines is Robert Jensen. He's an author and a professor of journalism at the University of Texas at Austin. Hi, Bob. Hello, Sonali. The International Committee of the Red Cross warned this morning of a humanitarian disaster unfolding in Yemen, the poorest country in the Persian Gulf and one of the poorest in the world. Yemen has been the target of a major war launched by Saudi Arabia with U.S. backing. More than 4,000 people have been killed and tens of thousands injured. ICRC President Peter Maurer visited Yemen and said, quote, the humanitarian situation is nothing short of catastrophic. Every family in Yemen has been affected by this conflict. Medicines can't get in, so patient care is falling apart. Fuel shortages mean equipment doesn't work. This cannot go on. Yemen is crumbling, end of quote. The Red Cross's warning came a day after Doctors Without Borders released its own assessment of the country, saying that the blockade imposed by the war is causing dire shortages. Patients in desperate need of treatment are flooding hospitals that are unable to cope, and diseases like dengue fever are spreading. Well, Bob, do you think the, the do you link the horrific reports of civilian suffering in Yemen to U.S. policy under Obama? Or shouldn't this be part of his foreign policy legacy? Well, in some sense, everything that happens in the Middle East is a result, at least in part, of U.S. foreign policy, given our dominance over the politics of that region over the last six, seven decades. So, yes, we have a, we have a role there. The role here, I think, relates to Saudi Arabia. There are two other major players in Yemen. That's Iran supporting the Houthis and, of course, Saudi Arabia actively against them. And the United States has some leverage with Saudi Arabia. It seems to me that, although it sounds a little... Uh, uh, idealistic, uh, there's never been a better time for a regional peace conference in the Middle East where the U.S. puts its prestige on the line, dealing with Iraq, dealing with Syria, dealing with Yemen, all at the same time, and the United States finally using the leverage it has. Uh, it's, uh, it's idealistic. It's perhaps unrealistic, but it's the place I think we should be heading. And a year after the shooting of 18-year-old Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, the predominantly African-American city is once again the site of major protests and arrests. The St. Louis County Executive declared a state of emergency and nearly two dozen people were arrested last night. Although Ferguson police have assured the media that last year's heavy-handedness would not be repeated. Still, the city is reeling from the police shooting of a young black man over the weekend. Mr. Tyrone Harris Jr. remains hospitalized after surgery. And in Arlington, Texas, the community there is demanding answers over the fatal police shooting of 19-year-old Christian Taylor, an African-American college football star. Police yesterday released an audio recording of the encounter hoping to quell rumors. Taylor was shot while inside a building. Police were apparently responding to a burglary call. The officer in question has been placed on administrative leave. Well, Bob, it, it seems as though the number of police killings of unarmed African Americans has not slowed down despite the increased awareness. What good is awareness if cops continue to act with impunity? Yeah, awareness is good. Body cams are good. Cell phone video is all good at establishing the facts. But I think what we're really talking about is does white America care about the facts? You have a young African American man in Arlington. He's burglarizing or committing some kind of mischief at a car dealership until white America says, OK, that's not the basis for shooting a person. I don't see a lot of change coming. And that goes to an even larger question of what are police for? I think white America not only has to recognize the racialized disparities in policing, but really think about what is a police force for? Is it an occupation army of sort to protect those of us with some sort of privilege? Or is it part of a community? This is a big conversation that needs to happen, not only around race, but about cops in general. And finally, Democratic presidential candidate Bernie Sanders has racked up another major win. The National Nurses Union has just decided to endorse Sanders. The union represents 185,000 nurses around the nation. In a statement released yesterday, Roseanne DeMauro, NNU executive director, said, quote, Bernie's issues align with nurses from top to bottom. Sanders has continued to draw record-breaking crowds to his rallies, despite how early it is in his campaign. On Sunday, he attracted an estimated 30,000 people in Portland, Oregon, and last night in Los Angeles, 27,500 people showed up to hear him speak. Sanders has faced criticism from the Black Lives Matter movement for not making racial justice a priority, but yesterday his campaign released an extensive racial justice platform. Bob, in a few minutes we'll do an extensive interview on the issue of Black Lives Matter and its tactics, but I'd love to know from you what you make of the NNU endorsement. The National Teachers Union decided to stick with Hillary Clinton. Well, anytime a major union breaks with the Democratic Party's power structure, that's a good thing. The possibility of an independent union movement that doesn't simply genuflect in front of major Democrats is all to the good. In a sense, this may sound a bit odd, but 
I think the Bernie Sanders campaign, as it goes forward as if it can win, should really start thinking about what happens when it loses. I don't think there's a really a, a realistic chance that the Sanders campaign is going to succeed, but that makes it all the more important that what to what Sanders does when he finally has to drop out of the race. Does he simply uh, endorse any Democratic candidate, as so many of the left and progressive Democrats have done in the past, or does he really think about what it means to to help build a movement? The Nader campaign failed at that. The Kucinich campaign failed at that. All of the challenges have failed. And I think Bernie Sanders' greatest contribution might be to think like the organizer he was back in the old days. Well, I want to thank you, as always, for joining us today, Bob. And we'll talk to you again next week. Thanks, Anali. Robert Jensen is, the author, uh, is an author and a professor of journalism at the University of Texas at Austin. This is Uprising. We'll be right back.